The third letter of John. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who want to, and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone, and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. The Third Epistle of John Introduction and Commentary Altogether this last glimpse of Christian life in the apostolic age is one on which the student may well linger. The state of things which is disclosed does not come near an ideal, but it witnesses to the freedom and vigor of a growing faith. B. F. Westcott 1. Unique Place in the Canon Even 3 John, the shortest book in the NT, just one line shorter than 2 John in the original, illustrates the divine truth that all scripture is profitable. Like 2 John, its keywords are love and truth. But unlike 2 John, which shows the firmness of love in refusing to entertain those who do not teach the truth, 3 John shows the tenderness of love in helping those who have gone forward with the truth. 2. Authorship The external evidence for 3 John is similar to that of 2 John. These letters are so short and so personal it is easy to see why they lack the greater spread of evidence that 1 John has. Origen and Eusebius class 3 John among the Antilogomena, or disputed books. Clement and Dionysius, both of Alexandria, accepted 3 John, as did Cyril of Jerusalem. The evidence of the Muratorian canon is unclear in this area. The internal evidence couples this letter very closely with 2 John, and also clearly with 1 John. Together, the three support one another's authenticity. There is no compelling reason to doubt the traditional view that John the Apostle wrote 3 John along with the other two letters ascribed to him. 3. Date As in the case of 1 and 2 John, two general dates have been proposed. If John was writing from Jerusalem before the destruction of that city, a date in the 60s is likely. More commonly, scholars see the letter as from a later period when John lived and served in Ephesus. Thus a date of 85 to 90 has been widely accepted. 4. Background and Theme The historical backdrop of this little letter gives us a vivid glimpse into church life in the latter half of the first century. With just a few concise strokes of the pen the Apostle sketches in three characters, Gaius the hospitable and spiritual, Demetrius the commendable, and Diotrephes the self-seeking and unloving. Diatrephs may illustrate the strong self-willed personality that can show up in any church structure. On the other hand, he may show the trend toward one elder gaining precedence and rule over a formerly equal eldership. This latter trend evolved into the monarchical episcopate, rule of one dominant overseer, or bishop of the second century and following. Commentary 1. Salutation, verses 1-4 to Verse 1 as in his second epistle, John speaks of himself as the elder. He addresses the letter to the beloved Gaius, whom he loves in truth. 
Although we do not know if this is the Gaius mentioned in Romans 16 verse 23 or the one in Acts 20 verse 4, it is surprising how much we do learn about him in these few verses. First of all, we gather that he was a much beloved believer, a man whose whole life commended him to his fellow Christians. Verse 2. But apparently he was not too well in body, since John wishes that his physical health might correspond to his spiritual vigor. When John says I pray that you may prosper in all things it is doubtful that he is thinking of wealth or material prosperity. Rather he is speaking of physical well-being, as suggested by the next phrase, and be in health. Would we want our physical condition to correspond to our spiritual? Is it not sadly true that we take better care of our bodies than of our souls? That is why F. B. Meyer Riley remarked. It would not be desirable to express the wish of verse 2 to all our friends, because if their bodies were to correspond to the condition of their souls, they would suddenly fall into ill health. Verse 2 flatly contradicts what is taught by many so-called faith healers. They contend that all sickness is a result of sin in the life, and that if a person isn't healed, it's because of a lack of faith. This certainly wasn't true in Gaius' case. His spiritual condition was good, but his physical condition was not so good. This shows that one's spiritual state cannot be argued from the bodily one. Verse 3. The apostle rejoiced greatly when certain brethren came and testified of the truth that was in Gaius, and how he walked in the truth. It is good to have the truth in us, but it is better to manifest the truth in our lives. We should not only hold the truth, but allow the truth to hold us. Men would rather see a sermon than hear one. Nothing counts more for God in an age of fact than a holy life. Verse 4. So important was this to John that he could say, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Perhaps most of us think of soul winning as the greatest joy of the Christian life, and it is wonderful indeed to see men and women translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. But who can measure the heartache to see those who profess to be saved, returning to their former life, like a sow returning to her wallowing in the mire and a dog to its vomit? On the other hand, what a thrill it is to see one's spiritual children going on for the Lord, from grace to grace. Again this emphasizes the importance of follow-up work in all our evangelistic endeavors. 2. The Godly Gaius, verses 5-8 Verse 5 Gaius took a special delight in throwing open his home to those who had gone out preaching the gospel. He extended his gracious hospitality not only to those whom he knew, but to strangers as well. John says that he was faithful in this ministry. It appears from the NT that hospitality is very important in God's sight. If we entertain the Lord's people, it is the same as if we entertain the Lord himself, Matthew 25 verse 40. On the other hand, failure to entertain his servants is looked upon as failure to entertain him, Matthew 25 verse 45. Through entertaining strangers, some have unwittingly entertained angels, Hebrews 13 verse 2. Many can testify that through the practice of hospitality, meals have been turned into sacraments, Luke 24 verses 29 to 35, children have been converted, and families have been drawn closer to the Lord. Verse 6. Rewards are involved. Gaius' kindness was known to all the church. But more than that, his name is forever enshrined in God's holy word as one who had an open home and an open heart. And even more, Gaius will yet be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ, for he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, Matthew 10 verse 41. He will share in the reward of all those preachers he entertained. This is a good point to remember for those who cannot preach, you can receive a preacher's reward by showing hospitality to preachers in the name of the Lord. God will pay back all good deeds. His kindness will crown the kindness of men. Now John reminds Gaius that he will do well to send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God. To send them forward on their journey means not just a friendly farewell, but adequate supplies. This surely sets a high standard for us as we share our material things with those who preach and teach. Verse 7. A special reason is given why Gaius should be helpful to these itinerant evangelists, because they went forth for his name's sake taking nothing from the Gentiles. These men looked to the Lord alone for the supply of their needs. They would not accept support from the unconverted. To do so would imply that their master was too poor to provide for them. 
it might also give the unsaved a false ground of self-righteousness on which to rest. What a rebuke this is to the money-raising methods of Christendom today. And how it should remind us of the special obligation we have toward those servants of the Lord who go out in faith in the living God and who make their needs known to no one but the Lord. Verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. To receive them means to do everything possible to help them, for when we do, we help the truth in its onward march. 3. The Dictatorial Diatrephs, verses 9-11 to Verse 9. Apparently John had written along this line to the church, but his letter was intercepted by a man named Diatrephs, who had an exaggerated view of his own importance. He was a virtual dictator in the assembly. His sin was pride of place, an inflated ego, and a violent jealousy for what he regarded as his own rights, which he doubtless defended as the autonomy of the local church. Diatrephs had forgotten that Christ is the head of the church if he ever knew it. He had forgotten that the Holy Spirit is the vicar or representative of Christ in the church. No mere man has the right to take charge, to make decisions, to receive, or to refuse. Such conduct is popery, and God hates it. Doubtless Diatrephs excused his behavior on the ground that he was contending for the truth. But that was, of course, a lie. He was doing untold harm to the truth by refusing the apostle on the pretext of being faithful to God. And not only John, but other brethren as well. Verse 10. Not only did he refuse these true believers, but he excommunicated those who did receive them. He was a power-mad creature, prating against God's true servants with malicious words. John will remember him on his next visit to that assembly. Such self-styled popes cannot stand being openly denounced from the word of God. Their continuance in power depends upon secret meetings and upon a reign of fear and intimidation. Verse 11. Gaius is exhorted to turn away from such evil behavior and to follow what is good. Good works are an evidence of relationship with God. That being so, the apostle seems to cast grave doubts on the spiritual state of diatrephs. 4. Devout Demetrius, verse 12. Perhaps Demetrius was the bearer of this letter. At any rate, he had a good testimony from all, and from the truth itself. F. B. A. Hole says. Note, it is not that he bore witness to the truth, but that the truth bore witness to him. Demetrius was not the standard by which truth was tested. The truth was the standard by which he was tested, and having been so tested, he stood approved. 5. The Apostles' Plan and Benediction, verses 13, 14. John closes in much the same way as he closed his second epistle, delaying discussion until face-to-face -face reunion. We are indebted to him for these letters, giving us an insight into life in the early days of Christianity, and setting forth timeless instruction for the people of God. Soon we shall speak face-to-face -face in heaven, and then we shall understand more fully the occasional obscurities of divine revelation.